Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to the sixth annual Mafika Gwala Memorial Lecture presented by the Center for Creative Arts at the University of KwaZulu-Natal, presented in partnership with the South African History Online. My name is Ismail Mohammed, and I'm the director for the Center for Creative Arts. Today's webinar is presented as part of the 25th edition of the Poetry Africa Festival, and which festival is made possible with the generous support of the KZN Department of Arts and Culture, the National Institute for Humanities and Social Sciences, the French Institute of South Africa, Total Energies, and the University of KwaZulu-Natal. In Mafika Gowala's poem, Bonk A Bajahili, he writes, and I quote, sing, how can we sing with chain blocks barring us? The Malombo sound. Play, how can we play with games turning into nightmares? Talk, should we not talk with deep open voices? Wait, should we wait till the cows come home? I unquote. It is these very words that underline the theme of this year's Poetry Africa Festival. There is no time to wait till the cows come home whilst our young and fragile democracy is at risk by poor governance and a lack of accountability. Our festival theme is unmuted, power to the poet. Located within the Poetry Africa Festival, the Mafika Gwala Memorial Webinar aims to inspire, to celebrate, and to highlight the extraordinary work of the literary legend, public intellectual, and social justice defender, Mafika Gwala. He was one of South Africa's finest poets, he passed on Sunday, 5th September 2014, at the age of 67. Born in Verulam, KwaZulu-Natal, on 5th October 1946, he was known for his writings in both English and Isizulu. Using his pen to speak out against the injustices of apartheid, he also actively served in the Black Consciousness Movement and was a member of the Black South African Students Organization, as well as the Black Communities Project in Durban. Mafika Gwala has influenced a number of contemporary poets in South Africa. Since his passing in 2014, the University of KwaZulu-Natal, in partnership with South African History Online, has presented the annual Mafika Gwala Memorial Lecture to continue to inspire a current generation of poets, writers, and public intellectuals. In 2020, due to the national lockdowns imposed in terms of the National Disasters Act, to combat the COVID-19 pandemic, the annual Mafika Gwala Lecture was presented as an online webinar featuring public intellectuals, authors, and creatives, amongst them Fred Kumalo, Sam Moodley, Eugene Skiff, Dumisa Kobo, and Bridget Thompson in a discussion moderated by Ari Sitas. It's now for the second year that we celebrate Mafika Gwala's life and contributions in the online space. This year's memorial event features an equally esteemed panel with a keynote address by Professor Imran Kuvadia and respondents Dr. Betty Govenden and Professor Michael Chapman, moderated by South African History Online Director Omar Bacha. Omar will lead us into introductions into the panelists as well. It's worth noting that this year's Mafika Gwala Memorial Lecture marks the 75th anniversary of Gwala's birth. It also coincides with the 50th anniversary of the adoption of the South African student organization, Sarso Manifesto, which coincided with a cultural festival that took place at the time. The positioning of the Gwala Memorial Lecture within the Poetry Africa Festival lends itself once more for much more reflective and critical engagement about Gwala's role in the 1971 Manifesto Conference and the cultural landscape and our current cultural environment. The July 1971 Sasso Conference invited a number of cultural artists to join the students for two weeks and to discuss a cultural revival as part of the black, new Black Consciousness Movement. The jazz-inspired Malombo Band and the Serpent Players led by the actor John Carney and the late actor Winston Shona, as well as the late Nompe Kunyeli attended the conference. Mafika Gwala remarked that the conversation between these performances and the student movement fostered the new message for resistance that became characteristic 
of black consciousness. Now, the festival takes place within the Poetry Africa Festival, and we're hoping that this lecture tonight will once again inspire our poets to engage with the issues of identity and politics in our country. On behalf of the Center for Creative Arts, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this webinar and to invite you to celebrate the week with us at the Poetry Africa Festival as we give essence to our theme, Unmute Power to the Poet. I take this opportunity of expressing the apology of the Deputy Vice-Chancellor of the College of Humanities, Professor Ntlantla Bekizi, who regrettably cannot be with us today. Zoe in Johannesburg on a National Institute for Humanities and Social Sciences strategic workshop that is taking place at this simultaneous moment. Professor Mkizi, however, conveys his message of goodwill and, and deep appreciation to our distinguished panel for their contribution to the academic community and in particular to the humanities. On behalf of the Poetry Africa Festival and the Center for Creative Arts, we also express our gratitude to them. We also express our gratitude to our partners, the South African History Online, our sponsors, the KwaZulu Natal Department of Art and Culture, the National Institute for Humanities and Social Sciences, the, Institute, the, the French Institute of South Africa, and Total Energies, and to you, our audiences, for being part of this important event. It's my pleasure to call on the Dean of the School of Arts, Professor Nobush Lechlongwa, to officially welcome you on behalf of the University of KwaZulu Natal, and following which we will hand over to Umba Bacha to lead us with the panel into an inspiring and engaging discussion. Over to Professor Nobutle Klongwa, the Dean of the School of the Arts at the University of KwaZulu Natal. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Ismail. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. On behalf of the Deputy Vice Chancellor and the Head of Humanities College, um, Deputy Vice Chancellor, Professor Antlantlam Kize, I would like to officially welcome you to the Mafiga Kuala Memorial Lecture. My name is Nobuhle Shongwa. I'm the Dean and the Head of the School of Arts. Mafiga Kuala Memorial Lecture is presented by the Center for Creative Arts at the University of KwaZulu-Natal. And it celebrates and highlights the extraordinary work of the literary legend, a public intellectual, and a social justice defender, and that is Mafiga Pascal Kuala. As Ismail Mohamed has alluded to, um, Kuala has influenced a number of contemporary poets in South Africa. Um, and since his passing uh, in 2014, the University of KwaZulu-Natal has been working together uh, and in partnership with the South African History Online under the leadership of Omar Basha, um, to present the annual Mafiga Gwala Memorial Lecture. We appreciate the partnership uh, and the continued uh, collaboration with the uh, South African History Online under the leadership of Omar Bacha. We are also uh, appreciating that like this year, uh, we celebrate the 25th edition uh, of Poetry Africa Festival. Um, and uh, as, as uh, uh, Ismail has, has, has mentioned, um, this is intersecting with the 75th anniversary of Mafika Gwala's uh, birth. Um, and uh, this is uh, a, a, a good opportunity as it provides an ideal opportunity for a critical reflection and also to, to re-inspire uh, intergenerational dialogue with a current generation of poets who can draw inspiration from Mafi Gagwala's uh, work, his passion, his literary intellect, and his commitment uh, to social justice. I officially welcome all of you, especially our keynote speaker, uh, Professor Imram uh, Kovadia, uh, welcome Prof. Um, our respondents, uh, Professor Michael Chapman and uh, Dr. Betty uh, Gounden, um, welcome uh, our colleagues. And uh, I, I would like to welcome uh, all um, uh, 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 people out there uh, who are tuning in and who are going to be uh, with us for the rest of the week um, as we celebrate the week of poetry within the Center for Creative Arts. Uh, I would like to acknowledge all our sponsors and partners for the Poetry Africa Festival. 
um, the KwaZulu Natal Department of Sports, Art and Culture, the National Institute for Humanities and Social Sciences, the French Institute of South Africa, Total Energies, South African History Online. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I really thank the leadership uh, of Dr. Ismail Mohammed uh, for leading the Center for Creative Art so well uh, and for your leadership with your team. I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Hwangwa. Ladies and gentlemen, I hand you over to the director of the South African History Online, the founder director, Mr. Omar Bacha, who will lead us into the session that we come to this afternoon, Um Bacha. Good, good evening. Let me start by thanking the DVC, uh, Professor Shlangwa, our partners, the University of KwaZulu-Natal, the NIHSS, and his smile and his team. Sorry, um, something's gone wrong with my uh, connection here. Siabonga uh, Tumalo, and together with others in Pumalanga Township, right from the beginning, made sure that they brought along a number of students from the, from the township to our annual lecture series. At the same time, we began putting together with them a series of programs in that township in the spirit in which, you know, Mafika would have been absolutely thrilled to see young people writing, researching, and getting involved in cultural and educational activity. As we speak, our they, the, the young people in the township, or some of them are meeting in a hall and this lecture has been streamed. So uh, I want to say hello to them and thank you very much for your efforts. I also want to uh, use this occasion to remember Ivor Chetty. Ivor Chetty, passed away in June. Ivor became a very close friend of Mafika when he worked in Verulam, when Mafika worked in Verulam for George Supersad and Ivor worked for Clive Wouder. And uh, these two together with Enver Motala, who was working for another set of lawyers these three people would meet on lunch times and after work and have discussions, share books. And a great friendship grew up and Mafika became very much influenced uh, and a staunch Marxist. So before he became a member of the Black Consciousness Movement, Mafika was already by 1965 a very dedicated um, member, well, of a, a, an underground network that was set up by us and a discussion group. I came to know Mafika in 1965 and our friendship grew uh, to a point where, you know, we were inseparable at times, at the same time, we were at opposite ends of the political spectrum, but remained close friends. I, together with Mafika and others were, well, in, Mafika was instrumental in starting the 
uh, arts ensemble in Hammersdale. And in what was remarkable is that many of the members were young textile workers who began writing and they began to publish. In fact, some of them had their work published before Mafika uh, in the magazine that was started at Natal University and uh, called Bolt. And so a, a friendship grew and a, and a very, very dynamic group of young people in that township together with, and, and their influence was quite extraordinary. You know, I don't, I think that uh, there's a lot of information if you go onto our website on Mafika and about the cultural movement in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. So I'm not going to go into much detail. I, I think that what we need to do is spend more time looking at the work, discussing Guala, discussing also the, 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 the incredible meeting of minds because Guala became part of and was a very leading member of the Black Consciousness Movement. Mafika and I met uh, Steve Biko first when he was at Metric. And, and their conversation and that friendship continued until, well, the very sad demise and assassination of our friend but so but what was very important is his total dedication to the, the problem issues of the day and to ensure that you know people begin to write and we publish because it was a time when there was a, an explosion of cultural activity uh, largely uh, driven by people in the Black Consciousness Movement. Um, I'm going to stop there and, and just introduce very shortly, very just a few words about our keynote speaker, who is the author of nearly seven books, and his latest book, The Prisoner, The Poisoners, has just been published. Imran Kovadia is at University of West uh, uh, UCT and is uh, head of the writing program there. And he can say a little bit more about himself. After Imran, we will have Michael Chapman, who is a distinguished author and literary scholar, together with Betty Govender, who's also a distinguished author and literary scholar. And they would hope they would begin a dialogue with Imran on Mafika Gwala and the whole notion of speaking truth to power. I know Imran doesn't like that, but, uh, but I'm, I'll use it because that's the only word that I know. But, yeah, and and, and <coughs> sorry, excuse me. I, I asked um, Imran. Well, let me just ask Imran to start off, and uh, he can speak a little bit about himself. Um, so, Imran, the floor is on your for you. Open to you. Thank you. Thank you, Omar. Um, but my preoccupation in the last few months has been trying to figure out why it's so difficult for us to get anything done as a country, you know, to build a hospital, build a bridge, teach our children. Um, I don't have any conclusions yet, but one of the, my preliminary views is we spend a lot of time thanking people. And more generally, we've diverted a lot of attention to the ceremonial aspects of communication versus the um, effective one. So I, you know, I'm going to assume that take take it for granted that you're all being thanked. Thank you. 
um, and remembered. But I'm interested in, in seeing what we can do as writers, as intellectuals, activists, in moving our country from a country that's about commemoration and ritual to a country where things get done, action. So this is my very minor contribution uh, to that. Uh, what is a tradition? A tradition is very much like a baton race, you know, where someone's always carrying the baton and when that person picks it, puts it down, someone else is always there to pick it up, you know, whether it's a religious tradition or political tradition or a literary tradition. So I thought, let's start there. Let's start with the very last Mafika Gwala lecture. Um, two years ago, last year it was canceled. And two years ago, Fred Kamala reminded us that as a young man, he took a collection of his poems to Mafika Gwala to get his opinion, which is always a bad idea. Um, and he says, the great poet suppressed a giggle and then Mafika Gwala said to Kamalo, but what is a dale? What is a prom promontory? What is a no? In other words, Fred had used these words in his poem. Gwala said, you must write what you know. I want to see you next week. I want you to write me a poem about Doris. Okay. So in this story, which Fred told us, Fred Kamalo told us, it's, the story is about a storyteller teaching a lesson to another younger storyteller. And there's some lessons in that story that we can overhear for ourselves. Firstly, the importance of having a deadline and a sense of urgency, right? I want to see you next week, right? I want to have that bridge built next week. Um, secondly, and the kernel of Guala's lesson is don't reproduce words or ideas until you have control of them, until you understand what you're saying with those words. A writer, I think, particularly in particular, can't afford to be a corrupter of words or to be corrupted by the glamour of words, or worst of all, to corrupt or influence other people by channeling ill understood words. That's obviously the job of a politician. Right? What is a dale, by the way? So we don't all have to go off to our dictionaries and answer this question by ourselves. A dale is an open valley, especially in the Northern part of Scotland. So Fred Kamalo had used the word dale. What is a promontory? I went and looked this up. I had a vague idea, but I wasn't sure. A promontory is a stick of high land which juts into the ocean. And what is a noble? I thought it might be a monster of some kind. It's actually a small rounded hill. The word noble only lives on in the English language because according to conspiracy theorists, John F. Kennedy was shot by a second gunman on 22 November, 1963, who was concealed on a grassy knoll in Dallas, Texas. And some more questions since we're asking about words. What is a state? What is fairness? What is black? And how do those words move us to do things? When we use words that are so powerful, we have to have some idea of what's inside them without simply disseminating them. So those were Guala's first two lessons for Fred Kamalo. Thirdly, Guada was helping Fred Kamalo with the very most mysterious aspect of a writer's activity, which is the selection of a subject. He said, write about Doris. Uh, Omar was asking me for a title for my speech because, as usual, I delayed coming up with a title. But I think Write About Doris might be the best title I can think of, especially because we have to ask the question who was Doris? Kamala tells us that Doris, by the way, was not a woman. He was a colorful character who worked as a marshal at a local taxi rank. But he also was famous for telling stories. He moved from Shabin to Shabin telling stories and jokes in exchange for a sip of beer here, a nip of brandy there. I was shocked and disgusted, says Fred Kamala, that this great man of letters expected me to write a poem about a dirty drunk, unquote. Now, when a writer or an artist or a musician is at his or her best, he or she will have, have a kind of magical rightness in what they say or the music they play. And it's one of the main reasons we can have some faith in the arts, is that strange rightness which seems to come out of nowhere, like the guesses of a gambler or roulette player. The subject Mafika Gwala suggests to Fred Kamala, Doris from the taxi rank, is himself a storyteller and a joke teller who works for the minimum income of a sip of beer and a nip of brandy. That is to say, happiness, depending on who you are. But I assume in Doris's case, he worked for chemical happiness. Guala was defining the task of writers as telling the story of storytelling. Doris is the storyteller, 
tell his story. I want to talk today about the stories we've told ourselves about our country for 20 years, especially the stories we've been telling on the left, which is where most writers and poets belong for obvious reasons. I want to talk about the hold that those stories have on our imaginations and our sense of possibility and the connection between those stories and the disasters we see around us. And briefly to summarize, if you're not going to pay attention to any other part of my lecture, I've distilled it all into the following couple of lines. I'm interested in the extent to which the left wing in this country refuses to observe the phenomena around it. It refuses to believe in the country that it sees around it. It's embarrassed to be a merely South African left, which means dealing with the true circumstances of our country. And it's far too grandiose, too unrealistic, and too much in love with plausible formulations and commands. You know, the wonderful version of the South African command, we must have a national health care initiative. We must have a basic income grant. We must have a state-owned airline. Electricity must be free. Healthcare must be free. I invite you to think about the way that the word must works in those sentences. Our left looks at the United Kingdom and it thinks, well, the left in the United Kingdom is in favor of dramatically expanding the state. So we should also be in favor of dramatically expanding the state. But it never considers the difference between the British state and our state, which is much more like a sieve than a state. Who would put the hard work of millions of workers into a sieve? Our left wing looks at the United States and thinks the left in the United States is in favor of unrestricted immigration, which I more or less agree with. I think the United States could deal with millions and millions of immigrants. But they then conclude, why should South Africa have borders without reflecting on the difficulty of integrating millions of very poor and often unskilled people into our society and economy? Some of the causes are foreign looking left picks up are reasonable in themselves. I would say that the protection, for example, of different kinds of gender identity is a very fair cause, but the way they're talked about makes it clear that our foreign left is joyfully imitating some other society without first doing the really deep work. For example, securing respect for gay and lesbian people, respect that's embedded in the people and not distributed from the constitution. You know, there are many parts of our country where gay and lesbian people find it difficult to walk, where it's physically dangerous for them to exist. Surely these are the things we should care about in a step-by-step -step way, rather than leaping um, or pretending that, that we can implement the kinds of social policy that's difficult even for Sweden or the United States. But I think even more worrying and troubling than that is that our left has ignored and even in many ways protected mob violence by unions and students for decades, certainly by students in the last uh, seven or eight years. And it never imagined that the Zuma family would learn the same tactics and put them to work at a far greater scale. But is Jacob Zuma not after his own fashion, a fellow traveler of our damaged left? Once we become accustomed to mob violence, will other people not pick up the same tactics and use them? Our left in particular, and this is the most difficult thing to talk about, it's made a fateful and glamorous identification of itself with a certain abstraction of blackness without considering how many times ethnic mobilization in itself has brought everybody to grief in almost every country on earth. Now, underlying the left should have the most powerful message in human history. Firstly, that there's an equality between all human beings in certain respects. And secondly, that a loaf of bread or a glass of milk is of far greater utility to a poor child than to a millionaire or to a billionaire. Right? Those two axioms alone about equality and usefulness bring us as far as we need to in addressing injustice, identifying injustice and correcting it without the required interposition of Derrida, Lenin, Edward Said, or Malcolm X. Not that any of them are bad to read, but first you want to identify the real phenomena that are going on around you. Our phenomena are poverty, hunger, and underdevelopment, not Orientalism. So I want to speak in the spirit of Mafika Gwala rather than about him. He once wrote that Quote, problems don't melt like soap, but they itch under the skin like a ringworm. I don't know if any of you have any had 
ring wounds, but they're certainly very itchy. And they look terrible. You know, you get very frightened when you, when you have them in your body. Now, in those lines, Guala makes a connection, which is probably true, but it's very hard to justify in rational terms, which I suppose is why we have writers and, and poets. The problems in our country are starting to be felt inside our bodies. Maybe they've always been felt in our bodies. Conversely, the way we feel in our bodies, whom we trust implicitly, and whom we fear, what we fear, and whom we overlook, and how we overlook, shapes our country's problems. Is a kind of correspondence between the physical, between our body and our national sphere. Leo Tolstoy once said, a man is sitting, he gave, he gave us a very short story about the media. He said, and here's maybe the shortest story ever written. A man is sitting happily alone in a room and newspaper is brought in. The man becomes unhappy. And for those of you who read the newspaper or social media or follow Instagram, you know what you know what Tolstoy is talking about. That there's a kind of happiness you have from self-sufficiency, from autonomy, from being immersed in your own life, sitting happily in a, in a room, which becomes destroyed by certain kinds of connection to the outside world. Now, Tolstoy would want us to itemize the ways in which our unhappiness is driven by newspapers, or in our case, Instagram or Facebook, and also the particular parts of our body which are affected by the outside world. So what feelings do I mean? I mean, for example, the feeling of falling, finding that there seems to be nothing under your feet, that whirling sense of vertigo when you read that a young woman has been raped and murdered in a post office around the corner from your house. That's a feeling of falling that I've had. Many of you probably had it also about certain other situations or about this one. I mean, the feelings of horror and pity, like choking from an asthma attack, when you hear that a small boy has drowned in the pit toilet of his school and he's been robbed of his entire life, which has about it the same, which had about it the same beauty and mystery possessed by the life of any child, including my own. I mean, the feeling of being poisoned with a kind of bitter, and sour taste in your mouth when you listen to how some of our politicians and public figures speak or dance when they're questioned about grave crimes or spin corrupting stories which are meant to confuse and divide people. And I'm also referred to this terrible shock of anticipation in your stomach, in my stomach, as I'm sure it often is in many of yours. Just as if you're driving on the N2 or N3 highway and you see a truck sliding across the highway towards you. When you hear the calls to intensify the mistakes of the past, that mysterious South African impulse that we seem to have to create a new disaster from the ashes of the old disaster. I mean, for example, the desire to put the vicious criminals who bankrupted our country onto our backs again so they can ride us for another 10 years. Perhaps to burn down our shopping centers as a kind of offering to their good fortune. I mean the need to undermine the integrity of the courts by assailing judges who make good decisions. And I mean the sudden demand to seize white farmland and painfully re recapitulate Zimbabwe's lessons of starvation and desperation, as if any justice or useful revenge is gonna be found in starving the children of this land. I also mean the insistence on allowing groups of students to burn books and paintings and libraries, more offerings to our goddess of destruction as if anybody's life ever has been improved by burning a book. I also mean the reckless insistence on steamrolling the last viable parts of our economy by nonsensical comparisons to Sweden and Cuba, when we have a state which has run its own post office into bankruptcy. We live in a country of tears, as we all know, because we can be sure that we will hear a second and a third and a fourth version of all these stories of heartbreak and disaster, the things that happen to young men and women, to old men and old women in their houses. They will be identical in all their details next year and the year after that and the year after that until we stop counting. And it's through this process of knowing that we're gonna be present, the witnesses to an endless crime repeated endlessly, that we come to know something about ourselves, which is very important, that we have ourselves been subdued to these tides of murder and negation, that we work like the dyer's hand that Shakespeare mentions in Sonnet 111, that work on us like the dyer's hand that Shakespeare mentions. How disfigured, for example, have we become? 
Nelson Mandela's real contribution to this country was not as an icon of reconciliation or mercy or pity, but that he was a careful reformer. When you read his language as president, whenever he made a change of policy, he didn't do it by grandiosity, by saying suddenly we're going to lead to a world of prosperity or socialism. He didn't do it through abstractions, but he did it by carefully weighing up the advantages versus the disadvantages of each single change. Right? Whether it made sense, for example, to demobilize the army, whether it made sense to guarantee free health care to pregnant women and their young children, and it did make sense in both those cases. But he always was alive to the disadvantages. So even in the most sensible cases, he always noted the cost. He said, if you demobilize the army, you will then put many armed men, men with knowledge of arms onto the streets and they can commit terrible crimes. He was also correct. He understood the cost of antagonizing Afrikaners under certain conditions. He weighed when the ANC discussed moving parliament from Cape Town, he weighed up the costs very carefully on both sides. You know, should parliament be in Cape Town? Should it be in Johannesburg? Shouldn't be in Pretoria? And of course, his recommendation was that it should be in Kuno. Now, Mandela was still alive when we began to disfigure his legacy, which also meant disfiguring our framework of good and evil in national politics. He was still an active member of the African National Congress in 2001, when he was jeered behind closed doors at a meeting of the National Executive Committee for his accurate views on the HIV virus. The president of our country, who is still an honored member of our country at that time, who is still an honored member of our ruling party, circulated papers insinuating that Mandela was a pawn of the Central Intelligence Agency. As South Africans, we seem to worship power, not truth, and in general, we will not allow anyone, even Nelson Mandela, to tell the truth without retaliating against him. I've thought a lot about what happened to Nelson Mandela in those years, the early 21st century, and I've thought a lot about what happens to truth tellers in our society, it's something I'm trying to avoid happening to myself, which is why I, didn't, I asked Oman not to publish my speech. What Mbeki and others were doing was they were putting the squeeze on Mandela. And I define the squeeze as the use of amoral pressure to destroy any resistance in another human being, in particular to separate them from the community. Squeezing in that way used to be seen as the hallmark of totalitarian societies, but it's become something that we as South Africans do to each other, and we do it in open view. Sometimes it seems as if our country is made up only of squeezes and people who are being squeezed, although that might be too dramatic. But what else with, the, for example, the corrupt intelligence reports filed against Msibisi Jonas and Praveen Gordon to force them out of the treasury? What were the fraud charges created by Sean Abrahams, our director of prosecutions, to break Gordon, who was already an elderly man? This process of squeezing the honesty and truth out of a society is South Africa's distinctive contribution to a new hybrid between democracy and dictatorship. And it's why, although we are in name a democracy, so many of us feel so unfree so much of the time. And obviously, if it's bad for any of us who are relatively high up in the academic hierarchy or the socioeconomic have relatively high socioeconomic standing, that sense of being squeezed is even more powerful, far more overwhelming. The lower down you are, the fewer resources you have to defend yourself. Guala understood this corrupting force in our country, this corrupting hand and tongue. And it's the clue to his combativeness, which preserved his feelings and thoughts from corruption. It was a kind of defense mechanism for his mind. So we read, for example, about him that, I'm going to quote, a press release from the Poetry Africa Festival, which ended in Durban last night, this must have been 10, 12 years ago, touted the presence of Mafika Gwala as the exciting reemergence of the respected era Black consciousness poet. Crap, says Gwala. I've been, always been where I am today. Why do they speak of me as if I'm emerging from the dark? And according to the report of the article, that is the first of several questions I posed to him on the eve of the festival's opening in Durban. Guala throws it swiftly back at me in a clipped defensive tone. He says, you tell me. So the reporter says that Guala's new prominence is due to our new interest in our past. And Guala dismisses the statement with disdain. 
When was Poetry Africa started, he says. We agree about 10 years ago. And why have I never been invited before? Why only now am I being asked to participate? Now, when you overhear that conversation and you, you register that combativeness, it seems completely unreasonable. Right? It seems highly unprovoked, especially by this presumably innocent reporter. But in practice, that kind of combativeness is one of the few strategies we, we have left as thinking people, caring people, to protect ourselves. Now, are these considerations unpoetical? What would Mafika Gwala say? WWG, WWMS, I guess would be the acronym. In his well-known poem, Defense of Poetry, which is naturally an unpoetical poem, he asked a series of leading questions. He said, what's poetic about defense bonds and arms corps? Arms corps is the old uh, defense industry of the National Party. Gwala said, asked, can there be poetry in the Immorality Act? He asked, what's poetic about deciding other people's lives? And he answered that, as long as this land, my country, is unpoetic in its doings, it'll be poetic to disagree. Let's borrow the authority of another famous poet on what poetry can do. Joseph Brodsky, the Russian poet who became famous also for his English language essays, and who was put in prison for the sin of being an independent thinker in the Soviet Union, Brodsky compares poetry to the Air Force and prose to the Army. Brodsky meant to suggest that poetry has speed and acceleration, unlike the slow and unlike the solid and stolid slowness of creeping prose. But if poetry is in the air, where it can see further than everybody else and move further, it's essentially the reconnaissance wing of the written word. Poetry finds out what we can do with phrases, images, sounds, sentences, and perspectives creating an armory which earthbound prose writers like myself can turn to more ordinary purposes. Let's consolidate Brodsky's description and say that prose and poetry, theater and fiction, have to be the armed forces of the mind. We misuse each of our 11 official languages in South Africa. The greatest part of our utterances involve, at least our public utterances, involve unthinking repetitions of dogma, commands, and demands for obedience. We say, do this, do that, or else. Empty out your pockets or I'll stab you. I'll moor you, I'll clap you, I'll give you a snot club. I look these up to make sure that they were common sentences. The verbal arts, if they're working properly, are our only defense against the occupation of language by dogma, cliche, and command. Somewhere J.M. Katsia says, it's bad when I write, it's worse when I don't. There are a few things to notice about that short story in two sentences, which is a kind of mini autobiography, falling into the genre we've already defined today as a story about a storyteller. Firstly, this could see his primary concern with himself. He doesn't relativize his own condition or reflect that he's living in a country with people who have somewhat worse problems uh, than not being able to write, because he's at the center of his own story, of the story of his own misery. Secondly, he doesn't imagine storytelling as a form of connection, kind of joyous connection, but as a joyless duty. Thirdly, and the reason I'm quoting him, is the stylized pessimism. It's not quite black comedy, and it's not quite intending to be a joke. Instead, it's pessimism as a mask, which is hardened into a face. It's not deadly serious, given the nature of the pose, but it's pretending to deadly severity. So we shouldn't rush to trust the formulations given by writers and artists, including myself. By virtue of our profession, we mislead people and we mislead ourselves by weighing the impressiveness of formulas over the accuracy of our remarks. But I don't intend to invoke the stylized pessimism when I say that the situation of our country has never been more dreadful. Not because the country has never been worse off, it has been worse off for three centuries, but because the obvious remedies that we have, like democracy, freedom, and a constitution, have all been exhausted. There are no more obvious remedies. Consider the mixed community, black and brown community that Mafika Gwala grew up in. Here's are some, a few lines from him about that community. He says, remember mixed and united very low. All that is a dream circling around people's minds in rotation of the barrel setting of a pepper box. 
Now, we resolved at the beginning of this talk, as you remember, in the spirit of Kuala, never to leave a word uninterrogated or to repeat a vaguely understood phrase without pausing on it. So what is a pepper box? I actually had to look it up. A pepper box is a firearm, usually the size of a revolver, but with a number of chambers fastened together in a rotating cylinder. Which pepper boxes was Guala referring to? Did he mean Daniel Milan's or Johannes Stradon's? Did he mean Balthazar Foster's or Roy Woodley's, that old friend of Jacob Zuma, whose security company, according to reports I've read, installed guns and gunmen in Phoenix in July of this year. That mixed and united variolum that Guala talked about, a mixed and united Phoenix, mixed and united South Africa, are now two great violations of trust further away from us. How long before they are forever out of reach? The answer is not to drape ourselves in the cloth of one party or another, not even the apparent consolations of brown or black consciousness. Listen to Guala. He says, we didn't take black consciousness as a kind of Bible. It's a means towards an end. We needed black consciousness to correct the many errors that have been committed by our leadership. But then we started losing our followers one by one, dropping them off. The more dashikis we had, the more bourgeois we got. So success as a country, this is me, not Kuala, success as a country, which means the reduction of poverty and suffering to a minimum, don't come from consciousness or pride, but from a posture of learning and improvement, which means openness to new data and openness to the world. Mafika Gwala had to look through a curtain of lies to understand his country. We don't have the same curtain of lies. We also have very different data. We have to be able to look as openly as he did at the country around us. Nelson Mandela once set out the following proposition about our country. And when you hear it now, it sounds heartbreakingly optimistic. I want you to listen to it as an example of storytelling and joke making in the service of the good bringing people together and moving them together towards the goal of common improvement. Mandel, South Africa, he says, could bring something to the world through reconciliation and a joint effort of reconstruction. After our history of division and discrimination, we had faith that our insistence on a common humanity is one of the great benefits of the globalization of our contemporary world. The globalized nature of our world was one of the great new features that my colleagues and I had to catch up with at the end of our 27 years sojourn on Robben Island and other prisons. Incidentally, my secretary says to me every day, you have been loafing for 27 years. You must now work and be busy every single day. So Mandela, despite the criticisms leveled at him by people who never had to win a war, was a politician of genius. And in certain respects, and not by coincidence, by, but by necessity. He was the best and truest writer that this country has ever known. He understood that storytelling was one of the most important parts of being a politician. In the passage I've just read, Mandela tells a story of interchange and reciprocity, reciprocal learning, he calls it, between this country and the others in the community of nations. And to that, he adds the comedy of his secretary, who teases him about his imprisonment. You have been loafing for 27 years. Through that small remembered piece of conversation, he shows us the easy, informal, gracious, and warm relationship between the greatest president of the 20th century and his secretary. He gives us the example of a man who lives with the value of equality in his bloodstream, who has a strong desire, as we know, not to be dominated by any other person, and an equally strong desire never to dominate another person. Who would, as Mandela did, now take South Africa as a good example? This amazing process of reciprocal learning Mandela identifies, whether in the sciences or economic policy or cultural advancement, which is the source of all our strength as a species, has almost completely ceased between South Africa and the world, apart from our cell phones, which we get new every year. In our brooding bath of resentment, which is as true on the right as on the left, amongst the rich as amongst the poor. We are completely cut off from the world of, for example, Google and SpaceX, founded by a South African. We're completely cut off from a world in which Adewalo Adeyemo, who was born in Ibadan, Nigeria, in May 1981, 
is now the Deputy Secretary of the Treasury in the United States. And whether the Treasury in the United States is ultimately an agency for good or not, I'll, I'll waive that, that question because I don't know the answer. But I'm pointing to this amazing world of creation, invention, and discovery, which we call the future. But it seems to be even more unknown to us today in South Africa than it was in the past as if we are on an island and we're watching the world sail past us and into the distance. Our left wing seems to know only about the injuries of the past. It has no vision of the future and no understanding of how to take us into the future. Conversely, our right wing knows nothing of the injuries of the present and it has no explanation of the past. We have much more extensive information on economic modernization that was available than was available to Mandela or Guala but we can benefit from their clarity and honesty rather than ignoring the ruined lands of Zimbabwe, Cuba, Bolivia, and Venezuela in our attempt to construct our own idiosyncratic policy. How did Mafika Gwala see it? He said, we had our differences on African socialism, which I regarded as being half-baked and unscientific in today's world of advanced technology. To me, African socialism had the pattern I was watching in Natal that of a tribal chauvinism being molded in the name of black cultural identity and self-reliance. There were various projections towards an artificial Zulu unity. In the name of black consciousness, certain individuals and groups were riding on affluence and smiling all the way to the bank. Numbers can lie, but they can also lead us to inescapable truths. When Thabo Mbeki came to power in 1999, China's adjusted gross domestic product per person per capita was $873. Today, it's $17,700. That represents a 20-fold improvement, 2,027% since I got my PhD. I think that's how I measure all uh, historical events in my lifetime. In that same year, when Thabo Mbeki came to power, South Africa had a GDP of $3,081 per person. Together, today, the figure for South Africa is $11,800. It's a nominal improvement of three and a half times. But in fact, uh, because the basis has changed, our living standards are not much higher than they were in 1999. China understands that it's China, not Sweden. So it must solve real problems for the Chinese, not imaginary problems for imaginary Swedes. Whereas our left is constantly mimicking, as I've argued, the left-wing ideals of other countries, which have no applicability to our own. And they've led us into an economic death ride with devastated train stations, an electricity company that doesn't function, and schools, which can hardly be said to be schools. The only people who really know where, the, where this is going is the EFF and the Zuma faction. They know what the future holds and they've drawn the appropriate conclusions. In the South African way, they are fully prepared to thrive in the ashes of the country once they've burned it down completely, holding the people captive with the most meager grunts. Their resolve and their grasp of this very quickly approaching outcome is why they are the most potent and negative forces in our country. Can we end this death ride or even turn it back to continuous improvement something which is the birthright of a democracy. According to Guala, ideas more long ranged are more long range than an FN rifle or a SANA 77. I assume another kind of rifle, I should have looked it up. Those ideas will always crop up and surpass ideas born of repression. Maybe. Guala's utopia was spare as utopia should be spare. In his poem, he wrote that in the future, there'll be plenty to build on. We shall till and mine the land, not feed on fat profits. We shall share our efforts. We shall honor the machines. We shall honor the sun. We shall honor the rain to retrieve lost dreams. Mother, poets won't have to write of hate. Neither will there be tree and flower poems. No, poets will add or delete whatever is of a people's wish in concert with the people's will. There's no state anywhere in this poem and no grants, honor, collaboration, mutual respect, but no predatory state, no predatory party, nor a tondrepreneurial, tondrepreneurial class. As we know, our state, which is a sieve, doesn't redistribute money as it squanders it. 
It converts ambitious business people into conspiring thieves, and it demobilizes the working people and renders them incapable of constructive labor. No country in the world has a population which is less organized for work than our own, which is the meaning of having the world's highest unemployment rate. Cadre deployment, racial quotas, and crony economic empowerment as much as they are the unbending demands of the political and social factions which run the country, are the policies which created this disaster. What stories can we tell us, can we tell to rescue ourselves? I think we can turn to the story of the, of the communitarian and even libertarian left, which is in some ways the story of both Gandhi and Mandela. Neither of those men had a state to rely on. So they were interested in individual responsibility and community organization, decentralization rather than state-dominated centralization. Guala saw this already in Stephen Biko's life, in Steve Biko's life. He said, by restricting him to King Williamstown, the state must have thought Steve would fail to stand by his belief in an encouragement of black expertise and black self-reliance. But what happened is that the Black People's Convention operation grew in the Eastern Cape. And by the time of the bannings, it could boast of several self-help projects, the hallmark of which was the Zaneme Pilo Health Club. It's a story of self-help and self-reliance and constructive labor. Along with that story is the story of inner lawfulness. Mandela and many others in his generation gave us this model of having a sense of lawfulness inside ourselves. He, in particular, showed us what it meant to treat each person with fairness, and in many cases, how to treat an adversary or even a jailer with honor. That is the story of cherishing the spark of the law inside yourself, along with the blood of equality. Here's another story which tells us about the feeling of equality and how important it was to Mandela, one that I've, I've told many times. As president, Mandela made his bed every morning. On a state visit to Shanghai, the economic capital of China, he, he was told that the staff at his presumably very expensive hotel came in every morning and they found his neatly made bed. And they saw that as a negative reflection on their own work. They felt, well, the president doesn't trust us to make his bed. So Mandela called them in and he explained to them all in person why he thought it was important to make his own bed. Because manual labor, was a key aspect of keeping himself honest. And also manual labor was not something that people lower down in the hierarchy did, um, but because there are no people who are higher and lower. Manual labor is part of all of our lives. And it's why even you know, many left-wing people complain about the United States, often for very good reasons. But even in a conservative society like the United States, presidents like Jimmy Carter and Bill Clinton show up at soup kitchens to work with their hands to feed people. They build houses. They show that they are not afraid to get their hands dirty. And I think behind that is this very powerful idea that there mustn't be a separation between different kinds of work, that all kinds of work are to be honored. Persuasion is also very important in any positive politics. It's by far the most important form of political action. Finally, any progressive politics, any real progressive politics, values the encounter, which is the willingness to meet people with whom you disagree. And in the very worst cases, allow them to attack you rather than be disconnected from you. We need to see in our adversaries, someone who can be transformed and someone who can aid in your own transformation. Gandhi, like Mandela, admired the professional abilities of his opponents, even as they were oppressed. For, as he said, who was Louis Butter, the South African general? He was a farmer amongst farmers. Gandhi actually praised Louis Butter as a judge of sheep who could hold his own against any expert and won a diploma for sheep keeping. Gandhi says that although Louis Butter won laurels as a general, actually fighting occupied a very small part of his life. I think this is a very important point. Jan Smuts, according to Gandhi, wasn't merely a general, but he was a lawyer and he was also an excellent farmer. So for Gandhi, and I think for Mandela, they were alive to the value and importance of steady and constructive work. Mandela, however, was much more enthusiastic than Gandhi about science. I'm going to say one last thing about Mandela. He was not sentimental about the poor or 
for the most part, the rich. I have, there's some people who believe that he had an had a unnecessary love of the rich, but I don't think enough celebrities. I don't think that's entirely true. But he said that there was something, I'm quoting, there's something wrong with a society in which freedom is interpreted to mean that teachers or students go to school drunk, striking workers resort to violence and destruction of property, business people lavish money in court cases simply to delay implementation of legislation, and tax evasion turns individuals into heroes of dinner table talk. I hope you recognize how Mandela in that story about our country manages to offend everybody without actually offending anybody because we know that he's completely true, completely right. Mandela said the country needs to infuse itself with a measure of discipline, a work ethic and responsibility for the actions we undertake. It means, says Mandela, mobilizing one another and not merely waiting for government to clean our streets or for funding allocations to plant trees and tend schoolyards. It means, said Mandela, decentralizing education to make every home, every shack or rickety structure a center of learning. It means, Mandela said, building and thinking rather than destroying. Coming from a past where authority was resisted, where state structures were fair game, and the mantra of the day, according to Mandela, was we shall support everything the regime opposes and opposes everything it supports. Mandela said there is now a need for a mental switch. And I think that Mafika Gwala, who was just in touch with the people's will as Mandela, would have agreed. Thank you. Thank you, Omar. Sorry. Uh, uh, storytellers like Doris are absolutely necessary. I, I think I must link you up uh, Imran to a number of Doris's I know, but nevertheless, I think that, as I said before, you seem to have got to understand reading Guala, reading his poetry in a way that very few other literary uh, academics have done. Because you're right. Mafika and his generation were involved in coming to grips with the ordinary and to make that ordinary extraordinary by embracing people, uh, no matter where the station in life is. And so he was critical. In fact, he, I think, uh, and Mandela and that generation we're looking at what was happening at the north of South Africa. And we're very aware of what change can come, what change can do to a country if it is not properly grounded in bringing the people, ordinary people into the making of the new society. And I think, and I think that point you make is very, very, important because that's the center of sort of the Marxist thinking at that time, even of black consciousness of involving people in development and not imposing and informing, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> and, and involving people in, in uh, making of a new country. But uh, let me leave that there and ask Betty and, and, and Michael to come in and, you know, make their comments. Betty, would you like to kick off? Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm speaking to you from Johannesburg. And I shall omit the list of thank yous that I was going to begin my little input with. The inaugural memorial lecture in Gwala's honor, I, for that memorial lecture, I composed a poem which I entitled In Defense of Poetry. And uh, incidentally, I presented it at uh, the University of KwaZulu-Natal at the Howard College venue. This happened on the 16th of September, 2015. In composing my poem, I was imitating the substance 
of Guala's own poem in defense of poetry. And I was setting it in post-1994 times. If Guala was writing against the specter of Sharpeville and hardened by the tears of Soweto, as he writes in his poem, There Is, my poem was in the wake of Marikana, which happened in 2012. And it was against service delivery protests and other problems in the country at that time. So maybe you could omit all the notes that I sent and just focus on the poem for now. Pomelo, thank you. <clears throat> anyway, for today, I've extended that earlier poem that I composed, and I'm happy that Imran has already discussed and referred to the poem in defense of poetry in his uh, challenging lecture. For today, I'm going to share the original poem that I wrote in defense of poetry, and I'm going to extend it at the end, drawing from Imran's speech. So this is my poem in defense of poetry. What's poetic about the lamentations of widows, weeping for minors shut down? What's poetic about the shacklands, Joe Slovo, Chris Harney, Lusaka, sun's water, sun's electricity, sun's hope? Can there be poetry on the famished road to nowhere, naked children at dusty street lamps? What's poetic about yesterday's totoing? Songs and dances of the poor, old weapons for the new time. Tell me, brother, tell me, sister, what's poetic when truths lie buried? Phyllis Naidu waiting for answers, restless in her grave. What's poetic when our sister's blood, our brothers, Victoria and Griffiths and Kanga are crying out to me from the ground. Can I forgive? Can there be poetry when our very brothers hang up their harps on the willows, afraid to sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? Tell me, sister, what's poetic about still being the second sex? No paradise yet. Tell me, brother, what's poetic about black skins still in white masks? And drawing from Imran's lecture, what's poetic about the whirling sensation of vertigo we feel in our bodies, in our country of tears? Tell me, sister, tell me, brother, what's poetic about this, our disfigured legacy? the fading rainbow, where truth and honesty are squeezed dry. What's poetic about the occupation of language, the death ride to barrenness, the blood of equality spilt on our beloved land. As long as this land, my country, is unpoetic in its doing, it will be poetic to disagree. Thank you, Imran Kavadja, for reminding us that prose and poetry are indeed the armed forces of the mind. Aluta Continua. Thank you. Thank you very much, Betty. That was lovely. Michael, do you want to come in here? Um, I don't know if you can hear me because I appear as you. <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> no, you I'm can Omar. hear me. We can okay, hear you. I'm, okay, I'm, sort of, I'm not Omar Badshaw, but uh, Michael Chapman. To disagree anything that Imran kind of live in this country which had so much promise and seems to have got itself into a real ditch. Um, Interesting, uh, uh, the mention of um, Steve Nico, and uh, one may also 
I think of a person who's often linked in decoloniality. Name is uh, on um, a kind of typical typical example of is of ended up the when um, the the so-called decolonial drive, which we now seem to all are all in reading by the department and to change everything. Um, the phenomenon that's mentioned is the phenomenon of um, bloody revolution. Uh, never on who produced a political elite, which we seem to have inherited now. The Biko who's um, invoked as Biko of uh, self of the black man, you are on in South Africa, <laughs> in US black power. Not the Biko who says he's away at a rally. This isn't racism. The antithesis to this must be a strong solidarity amongst the blacks on whom this white racism seeks to play. He says, out of these two situations, we can therefore hope to reach some kind of a balance a true humanity will have no place. And I think that sums up many uh, Guala's poetry. One thinks of him as the, the radical black consciousness poet. In one way he was, but he was also far more um, various and talented than some, a singular response to anything. Um, I think of his little poem, Quella Ride. It's just modernist imagination. Michael, you're breaking Me? up, so... Yeah. Okay, well, I can't do anything about that. Um, maybe, <laughs> maybe, possible... Michael, maybe, maybe turn your video off and just let it do the audio. All right, let's try Is that. that would work? Okay. Is it any better? Hello? Yeah, carry on, Michael. Yes. Okay. Right, well, I was just going to quote his poem about a passbook arrest leading to a renewal in and of a came the crawled in young men sang dark moment it all familiar or another of Guala's poems where he takes the wider world of poetry and bends it innovatively to the local demand in Africa when a snake sticks out its forked tongue it is pleading for justice. It's not the tongue of the snake that bites. A um, little story about Mafika to conclude. Takes me back to Poetry Africa 2013. I found myself sitting in the foyer of the Elizabeth Snetton Theatre together with Mafika. Stage. There's the new synth. I'm at the African Writers Meeting and Dean Gordon say early 1980 because says, I remember James Matthews, he had dry always dry on his flight down. And Sipa Pamla trying to keep order. And um, um, he says, now, now we have several poets. We've got Ben or Dakota Magoli, who, after he came out of jail. Even Baleka Mbeti calls herself a poet, and her ex husband, Jose Sidli. And I think then so little poetry, just slow sing. Listen, we hear a noise. Uh, be added that the, the, the guest speaker, hello, Jordan, too long, overstayed their well on stage. So at quarter to 12, it was his turn to listen. Sounds like a music concert to a political rally. But I live quietly in Hammersdale. I say to him, the stage poet's in, Mafika, the page poet's out right now. Huh. That the poetry Douglas Livingston didn't like. 
we corresponded off a bit. How's he? Still writing? No, Mafiki, he died almost 20 years ago. Aish, I'm really out of things. Here's the signal. I've got to go onto stage to perform. I don't think we'll meet again in another 20 years time. What did Douglas once say? I remember the line, the poem about an Indian fisherman, contempt for death, the only freedom, something like that. As I walk on stage, should I shout a mandla? I don't think so. These youngsters in the audience, they'll say, who's this gray beard? So, a, a, a full human being of complexity in many places, Mofika Gwala. I don't know if anyone was to add anything that I'm not giving the talk. <laughs> Thank you very much. Have you, have you finished, uh, Michael? Uh, yes. Yes, it is there any questions from people. Oh, yeah. Uh, just let me um, uh, say to our, uh, our audience that Michael uh, is uh, experiencing a load shedding in his area. So he's just using his, his uh, computer and, and uh, equipment. And that's why we are getting, we're not getting a very clear mess, uh, signal from him. So please uh, uh, bear with us. Um, people have uh, asked a number of questions and I'm just going to try and, and uh, uh, raise some of them. Uh, uh no it's fine it's it's we've covered most of it um but imran do you want to have the final say we've got i think we've got uh 15 10 15 minutes left no yeah, i mean I'm, I'm happy to talk about anything that that you or betty or michael would like to uh would like to talk about um uh, omar is there any particular topic you want to pick up on, the subject you'd like to talk about? Well, I, I you know, I, I think that what is important, firstly, with Guala and his work, Guala as an activist, is that he stood out, he spoke, he was critical, um, and he was still an integral part of the black consciousness movement and an important part of the black consciousness movement. And he wasn't dogmatic uh, as much as the fact that he could be like Doris sitting mm. and then having a drink and then becoming mm. quite dogmatic, but, but actually he was there looking to instill a sense of debate and, and comradeship uh, to move the struggle forward. And, and that went alongside his work in the community, his work and belief in e exchange of labor, of ideas, and nurturing a new you know, generation of activists and writers and poets. And as we've seen, Fred Komalo and others who come from Pumalanga are, are an example of that sort of slow but steady work um, and, and exchange of ideas and respect for each other. Central to, and, and one of the things about uh, Guala is that he was very much in touch with what was happening and, and very sensitive. A lot of his poetry is about travel between various parts of Durban and, and which epitomized the, the, the breaking up of communities. And, and, um, and he was actively involved in trying to find ways of reconnecting on the basis of his poetry, he used his poetry, like other poets of that period, 
to reflect on what was happening and and uh, and they did it under very difficult conditions we didn't have the type of audience that we have now um, but the audiences that were there became the engine house of the new change that was happening in the country but he all the time was a at first and foremost a storyteller and i think that is important that's the point that is underlined in whatever he's to tell stories and to open people up to the possibilities that exist uh in my case you know i learned a lot about zulu literature and zulu culture and language from him and and you you know and it helped me open up um in a way that wasn't in, imposed and said no you must learn zulu you know he made it a very very exciting exploration and in turn learning from his uh, interaction with others he opened himself up and he was critical and i think that speaking out was something that was very important for him but he spoke at many levels and many audiences and left a legacy which is quite extraordinary uh, i'd like to i uh, you know are there anyone else who's got any questions from the audience from you smile do you want to say something well thank you very much we are going to have to round up but if there are questions we will like to continue the discussion on our social media pages it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. ourselves as a social media festival uh with a lot of the engagements continuing way after the webinars have taken place uh i'm going to borrow from you umar where you said to tell stories to open people to the possibilities of what exists if we are going to be a meaningful festival i think that's exactly what we need to be able to do uh and the inspiring talk that we received from imran and the inputs from betty and michael as well uh have been the catalyst for what we could do in the next five days but also continue to do through our other festivals uh at the center for creative arts uh we 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 know that we, we look around the room we don't see anyone very young but i want to assure everyone that our program is being transmitted to schools as well uh so we are having younger people engaging with the talks and the programs that are presented at the center for creative arts uh including this particular webinar that's taking place today so once again i'm going to keep it very brief just to say thank you to imran michael and betty and to you umar we hope that we can continue to do this again uh without having to wait for a once year event but to be able to remind ourselves constantly around the values and the philosophy uh of mafika gwala and that we all continue to do what our theme of this festival is to unmute and to give the power to the poet thank you very much can i just add one little thing that uh, imran's paper would be published on our website uh, uh, and so people can go in and read it tomorrow thank you very much ismail and your team and to the university and to our speakers um and good night thank you thank you very much everyone